Hello and welcome to Community Chats. I'm your host Ali Hammer and today we're joined with Danu, the CTO and founder of Rush Digital. It's so great to have such a creative New Zealand customer on the show today. So Danu, can you start by telling us a little bit about Rush Digital? So Rush really started, uh, I, I started the company about uh, 10 years ago straight out of university and it was uh, really born out of uh, seeing the iPhone run a, a full desktop web page without missing a beat. And you know, when I saw that, I was like, look, this, this technology is gonna be really relevant. And the fact that it's connected to the internet means that you know, how, we, how we integrate all of these uh, handsets around the world is, is gonna be a pretty important thing. Um, so we started off actually in video games. Um, so most of our engineering capabilities started off uh, working for clients like Disney and Microsoft, uh, moving you know, IP from one platform to another. And then as the world became more and more digital, uh, it was clear that actually our engineering team could be put to a lot better work um, and a lot more uh, versatile and distributed types of uh, challenges. So we started to do things uh, with a more of a lens of how can technology uh, unlock the potential for, for humans and, uh, and all of the use cases that we, we, we can come up with. Um, so that, that kind of led to a vision of, you know, Rush building and designing technology to better serve humankind. And as you know, shown by the work that we've done with various clients, uh, we really try and take a, a social good lens and make sure that we're using developer privilege and our abilities uh, as technical and design, um, you know, innovators uh, to, 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 good, to do good work like the COVID trace route. That's such an interesting journey that you've taken. And I love that you're having a social impact. So thank you so much for sharing that. I guess, what does human-centered technological design mean? I, I think I heard you throw that term around. How can technology be built to be human-centric? Yeah, so I think the way that we wanted to approach um, building technology was around the idea that technology serves humans. It shouldn't be the other way around. And actually what that means is that, you know, the human is in the middle of all of the applications and the outcomes that we are after. And technology is merely a platform and in, in a lot of ways a slave to that outcome. So human-centered design is all about putting the human who is most impacted in the center of the design process and then crafting the requirements and then building the technology to fit the human rather than try and get the human to adapt to the machine. So what that leads to is, you know, beautifully designed products, well thought out products, and also, you know, uh, an engineering outcome where you're not trying to uh, shoehorn uh, one piece of technology in because it's the only thing you know, or it's the only way that you know how to do something. It really uh, makes sure that everybody's focused on the problem and the humans that have to be involved in solving that problem, and then how technology can be wrapped around those humans and that problem to get a better outcome. Wow, you explained that very eloquently. What an exciting way to connect, you know, the digital world more intricately with human nature. That's so cool. And recently, Danu, you've been working with the New Zealand government to help them manage contact tracing. This is so exciting. And it's a solution that's now being rolled out all over and actually in the UK as well. So can you tell us about this process and how you work with your customer to build such a unique solution? Because that's pretty incredible. As I said earlier, Rush started off as an engineering company, so our reputation in engineering um, is is quite quite highly regarded, uh, I believe, in the market. And when we were approached with this problem, the understanding was that we actually needed to build something really reliable that could serve an entire nation. And it needed the, the sooner we could get it out, the the more impactful it could be, and the more lives it potentially could save. So our approach with that uh, was. I guess, you know, we, we, we actually built the first version in about six weeks. Um, and if you think about the, dip, the typical uh, time span involved in, you know, not only government projects, but even large corporate or large enterprise, six weeks is, is, is a blink. And to do so with the scale and reliability that we achieved uh, with the solution, uh, we could have only done that with, you know, uh, really incredible technologies like serverless um, and the AWS um, stack. So when we were working with the government, um, there was actually already a pilot program in place that um, the government had, had, had looked into the AWS stack um, very cohesively. So we actually had a really good jumping off point to be able to execute really quickly. Um, and working with the government, again, we approached it human-centered. And you know, in my lifetime and in my career, I think the thing that I really love and respect about this project is that everyone was there just, just to help out. I think everyone put aside all of their differences and really focused on hey, if we can deliver something that actually 
provides just a bit of value as a goal, then we can have a big toolbox that could really materially save lives. So, you know, focusing on building reliable technology that was simple to use, didn't have really complicated um, un underlines was actually a real core philosophy because we needed we needed scale quickly. Wow, this is so inspiring, and it's so cool to hear how you know cloud technology can be built to cater for you know the he the needs of your customers and save lives, and also scaling so quickly is really impressive. I guess how has the cloud helped you better service your customers? Yeah, I think one thing that I wanted to talk about was we had very specific privacy challenges with the COVID Tracer app. Mm -hmm. The you know out the gate we weren't sure how a government app might have been received and actually new zealand the new zealand government has a, a huge and high regard for individual citizens privacy and the model that we employed with the COVID tracer app was completely decentralized storage of that contact tracing information so the the any individuals uh locations that they scan through purely stored on the phone so what that meant was that the the cloud infrastructure that we had to build for you know, collecting contact tracing information or connecting the contact tracing system to a user's phone for when they tested positive. That stuff had to work really well out of the box and be really reliable because we had a really core function that was going out to millions and millions of users that was purely stored on the endpoint, entirely encrypted. So there's a lot of focus and effort to make sure all of that technology worked. And if we had the burden of building a really complicated, hard to manage cloud uh, piece of infrastructure, we would be diverting valuable resource uh, to you know all of that so in terms of how cloud technology allowed us to execute really quickly you know some of the technologies that we use like dynamo db has the time to live built in so we had a policy when we launched that we would only store about 30 days worth of data um, and dynamo db allowed us to you know anything that we were storing in cloud that wasn't location data uh, it allowed us to just turn on that time to live setting for that record and know that it was taken care of and then, of course, serverless. The entire stack is, you know, uh, hyperscalable. Um, so we built the we we leveraged lambdas a lot. Um, we didn't really use SQL databases at all. Um, and you know, the combination of Dynamo API gateway and lambdas really allowed us to not really be too concerned about if an endpoint got hit really hard, which it did. Um, whenever you know there was an outbreak, we would see scan rates uh, skyrocket and sign up rates for the app um, skyrocket. And it allowed us to just be super efficient with all our cloud resources and whenever we got one of those spikes, you know, we had the comfort and the government had the comfort to uh, know that it would perform. And one of the really valuable things um, with something like this, again, going back to that privacy and compliance, uh, compliance uh, requirement is security, you know, uh, using lambdas and API gateway and all of these cloud products, they just require a lot less maintenance. We don't have to patch VMs. We don't have to um, check firewall rules as, 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 as comprehensively because the setup is so much simpler, you know, all of these things, they add up to making, um, you know, that approach uh, save time in execution and just be easy to manage and, you know, continue to do, deliver value after that first version has dropped. So exciting. I mean, the journey that you guys have had in the last year is so cool, so impressive. I just wanted to ask you one more question. I mean, on the topic of COVID, you know, it's been a little bit isolating. We've been all working from home uh, many parts of the year. So, how do you keep a fun working culture within your business? I mean, is it all over Zoom? Do you have any step challenges? A lot of companies have shared really quirky, fun things that they've been doing. What do you guys do to keep the culture and the the, the vibe up, I guess? Yeah, uh, this has been really interesting because I think, you know, I, I like to try and do a bit of reading and try and understand what other, other great companies are doing in the space. But the COVID situation is so unique to our lifetime. Um, it's happened before in humanity, but they haven't had, you know, the types of jobs that we've had and the types of lifestyles that we've led. So I think, you know, the the cultural aspect of of companies and how to manage and you know keep building that company uh, culture and also the the massive abrupt step change. You know, we had a culture that was built around sort of uh, proximity and location and and you know almost physical contact in a lot of ways. And Rush as a company, you know, we have sports teams and, you know, people hang out after hours and all of that stuff. When you take that stuff away, it's, it's, it's pretty disruptive. So, you know, one of the things that we tried to do, and we, we still call it this, we, it's, it's called an awkward Zoom quiz. And basically we, we, have, a, we have a ritual called Cheers 2, which happens every Thursday. And we, we just have a few company drinks, eat some cheese, um, listen to some music and chill out in the, in the cafe area. We tried to make that 
uh, online with Zoom. And, uh, you know, the first time we did it, it was so awkward. It was so awkward that it actually became a bit of a punchline. Um, so, you know, our team has a great sense of humor. They work hard. They work really hard. Um, but they, you know, they, they, they like uh, each other a lot. Um, so we were fortunate enough to be able to translate that into our awkward Zoom quizzes. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that really uh, we, we realized and, and started, I guess, in a lot of ways, not taking for granted was whenever we were out of a lockdown, um, we made sure we tried to make the best of it. You know, we started putting on a couple of um, staff lunches and just trying to get people together and try to make the most of the time that we had to get have together because we don't know when the lock, next lockdown might happen. Um, and, you know, it's the same for customers as well. They're going through a tough time. Um, building those relationships and bonds, um, you know, they're, they're really important to us. Um, we're a partnership type organization. You know, we, we don't see ourselves as a vendor. We've always seen ourselves as a partner. Um, and, you know, making sure that we brought customers along on the journey um, and also some of those cultural activities. Um, so we haven't quite invited them to the awkward Zoom uh, quizzes yet, but it's something that we're, we're kind of planning uh, to do soon. And um, I'll tell you one thing, Snap Camera makes, uh, you know, those the Zoom quizzes uh, a little bit more fun as well. Uh, dressing up as an AR pirate uh, goes down well with this fantastic beard. So <laughs> you wouldn't know what the, if it was real or not. You know, I wouldn't know if you maybe exactly. got some it... AI built in there now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tanu, thank you so much. I was really excited for this chat because we've only very recently expanded to New Zealand customers. I think you're you're probably our second New Zealand customer that we've ever interviewed. So I was thrilled to have you and, you know, researching the company before the interview was really interesting to me. It's so cool to see how companies pivot as well and create new, you know, when there's something so awful like a yeah. global pandemic, but the way that our companies and our customers have um, pivoted is really fascinating. So thank you so much for your time today. And I hope we can catch up again soon to hear what you guys are working on maybe a year down the line and to keep in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. I really appreciate it. The chat it was fun. Cool. Thanks, Senu. See you next time. All right.